Bible tells us that if we hear the words of Jesus and obey them, we're like a wise man who builds his house on a rock. When the storms of life come, and they will, we will be able to withstand them. All of our houses are certainly different and unique, whether we're talking about our walks with Jesus, relationships, marriages, parenting, or finances. But all of them need to be built on the words of Jesus. Uh, welcome. I'm Bill. I'm one of the pastors. We are really excited about this new series um, and it's really based off this verse. Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them or obeys them, I will show you what he is like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And we know who the rock is. Yeah, that's right. He's not a movie star. He is <laughs> Jesus is the rock. And we're going to build our life on him. So we're going to cover all kinds of topics in this series. We're going to talk about marriage. We're going to talk about parenting, talk about finances, relationships. We're going to talk about all those things because they're important for us to build those foundational things that happen in our lives on the rock of Jesus. And tonight I'm going to talk about practically how to have a marriage to die for. Now, before you cut out and say, well, I'm not married or I'm divorced or whatever, just know that I'm being very, very honest when I say the message I'm going to share tonight, it is practical for no matter where you're at. It's, it, it, it can work for any relationship. It truly can. It will obviously can help your marriage, but it can help your uh, relationship with your roommates or your parents or your kids or your neighbors or the person you're sitting next to. It can help in all those things. I've been pastoring for over 30 years and helping people for over 40 years with these things. And I'm telling you, these principles, although you've heard them before, we need reminding. And they can help you. And they will help you. I trust they will. And since I'm going to talk about marriage, I thought I'd give a little background of my, myself and my marriage. But I thought, why not have a, 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 an actual show of my marriage? My wife is right there. Come up here. And I'm going to talk about our marriage real quick. The woohoo lady is my wife. That's right. Some of you didn't know that. So let's talk about our, our family for a second. We got married 32 year, a little over 32 years ago in Des Moines, Iowa, August 12, 1989. We started having children, and we've done life and ministry together for 30, over 32 years. I was trying to think how long we've known each other. Though. Was it a few years before that? Three. You can, you can talk. About a year and a half. Okay. And, and that's a picture of us doing a marriage conference, actually, a couple of years ago in Nebraska. Uh, we started having kids. We have four boys that are now grown and are out of the house. They grow up so fast. And then, let's see. Oh, this was two year, three years ago, I guess. Two years. two years ago at the Iowa State Fair. And you'll notice the butter cow in the background right there. <laughs> Our whole family met in Iowa and went to the Iowa State Fair. And... We've, we've entered into a new season of our life. Again, this is just background. If I'm going to talk about marriage. We can know a little bit about us. So I'll let you talk about this season of our life. Woohoo! This is our <laughs> new season. We are grandparents, and That's it's right. official because we don't have one, we don't have two, we now have three grandbabies. So Miss Olivia's a year and a half. Graham was just born in August, and Jack was born just not even two weeks ago. So this is, this is our new, uh, new season of life. Yeah, it is. Um, so, before we get started, I also wanted to, to remind you about, do you guys remember my bean supper story? We went to Maine, went to a bean supper, and we, were, we felt a little unworthy, felt like we weren't really welcome. We went back to Maine last month, and lo and behold, we went past that church, and they were having not bean supper, but a pie sale. <laughs> Saturday, 9 a.m. So we, we looked at each other and we said, we're going to the pie sale, even though we felt unworthy last time. And we went, and they were there. We went about 9.30, 9.45, and they were delightful. And they were wonderful people. And they were sold out. And they were sold out of pie. So we, we still left unsatisfied, but we didn't feel unworthy. I, 
so, so it was a redemption moment, right? And I just wanted to share that with you because they are lovely and they talk wonderfully about their, pa their pastor actually bought them their pie shirts they wear and they're very excited about their pie ministry. They sold out in 20 minutes. So anyway, I wanted to give you a heads up on that as well. Okay? Yeah. So I was going to ask you before you leave, do you, do you have any words of wisdom on marriage? 32 years married to this guy and... Tell these guys if you have something. I think it's going to work out. Yeah, no, I, I think, think it's, it's, I think we're, I think we're going to make it. I think we are. I think what you said was true, that this could be for anybody, married mm -hmm. or not. To me, I would say the most important thing is you love Jesus and pursue him more than yeah. your spouse. And that would go if you're not married, whatever, whatever relationships are in your life, you pursue and love Jesus first and the most, and then the rest is going to happen. So. That's true. And, and she is a woman. Of, she's, I call her Proverbs 31. Whenever we get to Proverbs 31, I read that each month. I, I text her or talk to her and tell her, hey, you are my Proverbs 31 woman. You know, it says, charm is deceitful, beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Amen. And she is a woman after God's own heart. She pursues him every single day. Amen. Every day for 32 years I've seen her pursue Jesus. So, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Marriage is wonderful when it's done God's way. I did a wedding last week, and I told the bride and the groom and the audience, I said, listen, um, marriage is just not a good idea. It's just not a good idea. It's a God idea. And it can work when it's done God's way. It can. And I can testify that I would get married to that girl a, a million times over. Our, 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 our marriage has been so wonderful. And this I'll tell you about marriage. I don't know where your marriage is at. I, I deal with a lot of marriages as a pastor, and i, I just to be honest with you, there aren't that many that are doing well, in my experience. There just aren't that many that are doing well. And here's what I pray, and I have prayed as I prepared this message. I pray that you would have at least a marriage as good as Mary and I. That's not boasting. I'm just being very honest. I, I would wish that on anyone. It's been the best 32 years of my life. In fact, I realize that I've, I've been married over half my life now. We've just passed that, that crescendo. And it's been, it's been glorious. It hasn't always been easy, but it's been glorious. And you can have that. And, and this is something the church has to offer the world. The world doesn't listen to us very often. The world doesn't look to the church to say, how, how should I do a lot of the, the things that are happening in our world right now? But marriage is one of them. We should be an example to the world in how to do marriage. And I think we can. I think we can have an effect on the world if we focus on our marriage. So, um, so practically, how do we have a great marriage? I'll just summarize for you as we get into it here. You simply need to die to yourself. You want to have a good marriage? Go die. Go die some more. Die to your selfishness. Die to your flesh. Die to the me mentality. It's all about me. Um, in Romans 8, it says, For if you live according to the sinful nature or the flesh, your selfish self, if you live according to your selfishness, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of your body, you will live. Who wants to die? Who wants to have a horrible marriage that just feels like death? Nobody. Or a relationship that feels that way. You can live. You can have relationships and a marriage that's out of this world. But you have to die to your flesh, your selfishness. you got to live for others, i.e. your spouse, your children. Live for other people. And I'm just telling you, if you feel like, ah, oh, my marriage sucks right now. It's really bad. I need to call somebody. That's fine. You can call us. You can call me. But what I'm going to do is save you an email. What I would tell you is what I'm going to tell you today. Okay? This will help your marriage if you apply it to your life. So I just want to say this before we begin. Don't make the, the classic mistake that our world wants us to make. And that is simply this, that the ultimate truth in life is that you need to be happy. Don't make that mistake. Because that's unbiblical, number one. God never said the goal in your life is to be happy. In fact, Jesus said, in this world you'll have trouble. In this world you're going to have problems. And we know that's true with marriage. Don't make the mistake of thinking life is all about me being happy. How many people have gone astray in their marriages thinking that? That'll ruin your marriage right out of the bat. That is not where you find happiness. In, fa in fact, uh, Rick Warren in his 
world-renowned book, The Purpose Driven Life, the first line in his book, what is it? It's not about you. And that's so true. And I'm going to show you a video that kind of illustrates this point. Let's watch this. It's just, there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me. And I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head. And it's relentless. And I don't know if it's going to stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most is that I don't know if it's ever going to stop. Yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there. Stop would... trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing. You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. No, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, you're out. not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just, sometimes it's like, there's this achy, I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. That sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on. Ow. If you would just don't try to see things my way. Do I have to keep on talking to So it's not about the nail, and it's definitely not about you. And if we get that from the beginning, we'll be able to have a great marriage. So God's plan is different than ours. We're gonna look at how to have a marriage to die for in three easy steps. Let's get right to it here. Here's your first. You have a blanks in your handout. You can pull that out and follow along. Uh, you want to have a great marriage? Die by giving up your rights. We live in a right-happy world. It's all about your rights, about you, about what you need, what you should have, what other people should give you. It's all about that, but not according to the Bible. If we look at Jesus' example in Philippians, which we'll look at, Several passages from Philippians chapter 2, it says this, Jesus, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. So King Jesus chose to give up his rights. We should learn from that. Jesus is God incarnate. He is God in the flesh. He's the king of kings. He, it says, according to Colossians chapter 1, created everything. He made everything. He made you. He made me. He made all the ground that we stand on. He made the stars in the sky. He made everything. And he chose to give up his rights. In fact, in the garden, when he didn't want to go to the cross, he was battling with it. He said, Father, if you're willing, take it away from me. I don't want to do this. Yet, not my will, but yours be done. Our flesh is very strong. I don't know if you've noticed that. <laughs> Our flesh desires. The flesh is what causes us to be addicted to things. Our flesh drives us in a way that is, is one of the most powerful forces on the planet. It, it really does. And our flesh will keep us from saying, not my will, but yours be done. Our flesh is going to want to fulfill itself. And that really is problematic in relationships when it's all about you. And your flesh, we need to put it to death. Our flesh is kind of like the ring of power in Lord of the Rings. That's what the flesh is like. I want you to imagine that. Just think how the, the ring of power, how it tempted and it corrupted and it destroyed so many people and made them, what, selfish. That's what our flesh does to us. And the Bible says you got to put it to death. In your marriage, you got to put your flesh to death. All the things that you want, that you think are going to make you happy. Just your relaxed time. Just, I want to be pain-free. I want to be, have pleasure. I just want to, to, to have me time. I've heard that so often from people. I want what I want. I want to do what I want. I want to think what I want. I want to go where I want. That's the flesh. And here's the deal. Here's what I've learned. When we choose to die to our flesh, because we all have it, God has a way of bringing back to us and blessing us, oftentimes with things and satisfying us with things that we didn't even know we liked. 
or better than what we thought we were going to get that we gave up. We think, oh, I can't give that up, and then God has a way of bringing it back. Let me illustrate that with my wife. Which movie do we watch? Right? You've had this conversation. What are we going to watch? Chick flick, war movie, what's it going to be? Right? I have chosen over the years at different times, not all the time, but at different times, to yield my flesh to watch British movies, okay? And uh, so I have chosen at times to watch these, and, and is it okay if I'm honest and vulnerable here? I've watched these movies, okay, Pride and Prejudice. Not the new one, no, the Colin Firth one, the best one, the only one that you should watch, okay, Pride and Prejudice, and the great British baking show. I've watched them a bunch of times with my wife, and you know what? I like them. <laughs> That's okay. I'm just being honest. I like the old Pride and Prejudice, and I like watching the Great British Baking Show. I love their accents. I love that they're trying to get a good bake, and they're looking for soggy bottoms and the whole thing. I like it all. And I didn't like those before I chose to yield to my war movies, you see? And God has somehow just given that back. It's like, I, I would just watch that on my own sometimes, maybe. God has a way of doing that. When we die to ourselves, he has a way of blessing. But the world doesn't tell us that. The world just says, you gotta, you got to be true to yourself. you got to make yourself happy. That, that's what the world tells us. Let me illustrate it. I'm going to pick on country songs. I like country songs. They're just easy to pick on. Okay, that, that's all I'm saying. Here's what the world tells us. This is Travis Tritt, and by the way, I'm sure he has a great marriage. I'm sure he's a wonderful guy. But he sings a song, Lord, everyone around me, I've tried so hard to please till the only one unhappy feeling broken down is me. But things are going to change with each new setting sun starting now. I'm looking out for number one. It's all about me. This is where I'm going to find life. This is where you're going to find life. Looking out for number one. Here's another country song, lyrics. Dirk Bentley, I'm sure, again, a wonderful man. Great marriage, I'm sure. Girl, you look like you may be an angel, so I won't lie. I can love you like the devil if you want tonight. And we could talk about forever, for a day or two, but I still got a lot of leaving left to do. Yeah, I still got a lot of leaving left to do. So it's all about me, <laughs> not about you or commitment. This is what the world tells us. You have personal rights. You should demand them. And if you're not happy, then you should leave. Isn't that what the world says? Too many Christians have bought into that. That's not what the Bible says. In fact, you know, I'll just give you, there's so many examples that my wife and I could give you, but there's times, again, 32 years of marriage, we're different people. She's different, I'm different. There's times where we bug each other and we have to talk about it, like, hey, it bugs me when you do that. Would you, and we're nice about it, would you consider not doing that? <laughs> you know, it just bothered me so much. And I wanted to give you a couple of those examples. Okay, um, for my wife, she likes it warm in the house. I don't know if anybody else can relate to that. She, thank you for being honest. Yeah. So she likes the temperature up high. The higher, the better. Um, she, she is just cold naturally, so she'll get, we have a, a blanket that's a heating blanket that is dual control, so she can control her side, thank goodness, and I can control my side. So she cranks it up to a six or seven. I've got it off most of the winter. Maybe I'll turn it to a two just to get it a little warm and turn it off. So she gets into bed and she's got icicle fingers. I mean, just like she touches me, woo, just like, man. So I have yielded and allowed, you know, the temperature when we go to bed is about eight degrees warmer than I would like it. So when she's traveling, I crank it down. It's kind of like you can see her breath, open the windows, and I just sleep so well. Most of the winter, I'm kicking off covers because I just radiate heat. So that's one thing that I have chosen to do. Another thing I've chosen to do is, is to not drive like I do with her when I'm alone because it makes her sick to her stomach because I just, we got a new car and it's really punchy and it's like I love just goosing and just goes, you know. And she's asked me nicely recently if you could not do that when you take off, if you could just go slower because she's turning green while I'm driving. You can just see it. She's got a real sensitive stomach. So I drive differently with my wife and I drive by myself. For her, there's a number of things, but one of the things she's had to put up with over the years since I was in college in a cold air dorm with 30 other guys with the windows open all year round 
and a huge fan going to give white noise, I've always had a white noise machine. I can't sleep without it. So I've got, if I'm traveling internationally, whatever, I've got earbuds and I'll listen to white noise when I sleep. Mary loves listening to the crickets and the sounds of the leaves and the rain falling. For 32 years, she's not been able to hear any of those things because of my sound machine. And I've never heard a complaint about it. Now, I know she likes those things, but I literally, I would have a hard time sleeping. So she yields. She gives. Um, in our recent trip to Maine, we rented this Jeep. It was awesome. Uh, it has, uh, it was a convertible. You can take off the hard top. Uh, but, but remember what I told you about my wife's temperature? And it was kind of chilly there. So it was like, oh, man, I'm not sure if we're going to ever be able to take the top off because it's going to be super cold for my wife. And I remember asking her, hey, do you think we could take the top off? And she said, yes, take it off. She had already predetermined to say yes and to yield. She knew I was going to ask it, and she just yielded with a smile. And she, and she wrapped up in a coat and a blanket or whatever, and we cruised up and down the coast of Maine with our top off. She yielded. So, again, if we want to have a good marriage, number one, give up your rights. Quit demanding you get what you want, okay? It, it'll make for a much better marriage. Here's the second thing. Die. To have a, a marriage to die for, you've got to die by putting others first. Jesus did that in Philippians 2.7. It says, Jesus made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, didn't come down as a sultan, as a president, as a CEO. He came as a servant, a waiter. That's what he came as. And he wants us to do the same thing. But it's so hard for our flesh. <laughs> we don't like that at all. I, I wrote this quote down years ago in a magazine called Bits and Pieces. The trouble with some self-made men is that they worship their creator. You'll get it on the way home. And that's what we do. We think we're God. We think we have all these rights, that, that we're the most important thing, and we're, by golly, we're going to demand that we have it our way. Jesus didn't do that. He made himself nothing, became a servant, a slave of all. So how do we put others first? Two things, by considering the needs of others. What are their needs? Number one, again, in Philippians, we can read this verse. I love this. We taught our children, we had, had our children memorize this verse. It says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Let me read that part again. Do nothing, nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others as good as yourselves. Is that, is that what it says? Oh, wait a minute. Consider others better than yourselves. That can't be right. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Is that really what it says? That... Other people's needs are more important than my own. That is so otherworldly. And to, to practice that in a marriage, both of you practicing that, it, it'll flip your marriage upside down. It'll give you the marriage you can't even believe. It'll be so good. And a relationship, so good. If you're treating each other this way, this is how we had our boys try to treat each other, that your brother is more important than you. You need to see him that way. So he gets to play with your toy. And we try to train him in that way. Um, but it's hard. Again, we can have the attitude of Oscar Wilde, the famous playwright. He wrote this. Come over here and sit next to me. I'm dying to tell you all about myself. That's the attitude of the world. And we can be this way. Um, and I can be this way. I can just, you know, be in a conversation with someone. And I can just be a U-turn conversationist. Like, they're talking about themselves. And I just turn it right around to me. They say, oh, I had a... I hurt my finger. I had to get stitches. Well, I had to get stitches, too, you know, right here when I was 13. And let me show you the scar. And it's all about me. And this is, what it, this is what we are. And in marriage, we need to be thinking about other people. How do you do that? You listen, observe, be a master of the obvious. Be a, ask good questions. If you find out what somebody likes, if they like the NFL, find out what team, how their team do last week. Are you ever going to go see a game? Do you, are you going to watch the game tomorrow? Who are they playing tomorrow? Um, do you think they're going to go to the Super Bowl? You just start asking questions. You start thinking about them instead of yourself. People aren't all that interested in you or me when I just turn it around on me. But man, people will light up when you, start, when you push the button of the thing they love. I'm telling you. 
You want to win friends and influence people? You find out what, what drives them, what they're excited about, and you just start digging in and asking questions and learning about it. You do that in your marriage, it'll be out of this world. I, I, I want to show you a picture. My wife just uh, need to understand, I've told you this before, she, she does not like lobster. That would be an understatement. She doesn't like seafood. She doesn't like the texture of it. She would throw up if she had to put it in her mouth. So we go to Maine. I'm the only one eating seafood. But my wife, this is how she looks at me when I had my first bite of lobster two, three weeks ago. That was a lobster roll, about a pound, over a pound of lobster. And my wife waits for me to take the first bite. I took a picture of her looking at me. But she hates lobster. She hates the smell of it. She doesn't like any of it. And she puts up with me joyfully the whole vacation, just constantly eating seafood. This is someone who is considering the needs of someone else above herself. She does that beautifully. Uh, I think we need to adapt the old Burger King motto with each other. Have it your way. Want to have lobster? Have it your way. You want to do that? Let's have it your way. Let's, let's do what you want to do. What do you want to do? We need to have that mindset. Same thing. So here's some personal examples again, just that came to mind. Uh, if we're going to have that mindset of have it your way and put others first, it's going to cost us. Are you going to watch a chick flick or are you going to watch an action movie? That, we already talked about that one. Can I just say to you that my wife actually at one point said, said hey, I'd like to watch one of your war movies. And she said, which one would you like to watch? And I told her, and I'm going to do a little whistle. See if you, get, you guys will know this. You'll know what movie I'm talking about. Ready? What is it? Thank you. Bridge Over the River Kwai. She watched the whole thing, and did you like it? She did. She died to herself, watched one of my favorite war movies, and she enjoyed it. She died to herself. She put me before herself. How about you in your, in your family with your kids? Are you going to come home, wrestle with your kids, or are you going to go take a nap? Are you going to talk to your wife or a husband over breakfast, or are you going to read the paper and just look at your phone? Are you going to pay off debt, or are you going to buy your toys? Are you going to do chores, or are you going to watch football? We have choices to make every day in our marriage, in our relationships. I challenge you to put other people before yourself. And here's another thing when it comes to putting others first. This is so important. This is critical in our relationships. We need to learn how and practice extending forgiveness to each other. And, and let me tell you how God has kind of impressed my heart on this point. In the world we live in, there's a whole thing called uh, when, when you get canceled. Okay? And a lot of people are getting canceled. And, and you know what it really is when it comes down to it? God kind of shared this with me this week. Really what it is is it's being unforgiving. When somebody cancels you, they're saying, I will never forgive you. I will never give you grace. I will never give you mercy. That is so anti-Christian, so unbiblical, you, you wouldn't even believe it. But that's what canceling is. I will never forgive you. I'll never forget it. That's the opposite of what Jesus says. Jesus, in Luke 11, says he teaches his disciples how to pray. Forgive us our sins. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. There's no question about it. If you want to have a good marriage, you need to practice extending and giving forgiveness. You absolutely have to. In your relationships, at work, with your friends, with your siblings, with your parents, with your kids, you have to practice this all the time. And if you don't, if you buy into this cancel culture, I will not forgive, I will never forgive, you are going to be a hurting person. And I don't think your marriage has a chance. It certainly won't be a good marriage if you don't practice this. Forgive each other. You say, well, I don't feel like forgiving. I get it. Jesus didn't feel like dying. But he did. And then he tells us, forgive. He doesn't say forgive if you feel like it. He says, forgive. You don't have a choice. Oh, you don't know what he did to me. Or what she did to me. I know I don't. And I, and I know it hurt. You got to forgive. You don't have a choice. You are the hostage in this. If you will not forgive, you are the hostage. You are suffering because you will not forgive. By the way, forgiveness is a, is a matter of the will. Look at this verse in Colossians. Paul says, Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against each other or one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Well, I have to ask myself the question, when it comes to forgiveness, how did God forgive me? 
when I finally grovel at his feet and finally understood all my sins and, and acknowledged that I was a sinful human being? No, Jesus forgave me when I was an absolute rebel, sinning against him in his face, cursing him. Jesus died on the cross before I even asked for forgiveness. You need to forgive. You say, I don't know if I can do it. Well, let me tell you about Corey Ten Boom, who was a concentration camp survivor, watched her sister die in concentration camp, and didn't see her parents after they were taken away. They were killed. After she was out, she's a born-again Christian. She went around the world, really, teaching on love and forgiveness. And she says this about forgiveness. She says, the will can act regardless of the temperature of one's heart. You can forgive even if your heart is bitter or angry, you can forgive. She could do it. You can do it. And I encourage you, forgive even if they don't deserve it. This is not the criteria for forgiveness. They deserve forgiveness? Aren't you glad Jesus didn't do that with you? Do, do you deserve forgiveness? I don't. I certainly don't. In Ephesians, it says this, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. We need to forgive one another. You know, I've learned over the years that for a lot of people, the seven toughest words that you'll ever say is, I was wrong, will you forgive me? Those are hard words to say, but you must learn those words and you must practice them in your marriage. And then you need to find out the second toughest words, the second four toughest words, yes, I forgive you. Not, no, I won't, you're a jerk. That, that's not what God calls us to do. When someone asks for forgiveness, we forgive them. We forgive them, but I don't feel like it. I don't care what you feel like. You got to do it. You need to do it. You say, well, you know, we sinned against each other. There's so many things going on in our marriage. Who should start? Let me just give you this little bit of advice. Who should make the first move? Here, here's how you figure it out, okay? Who should make the first move? Whoever's the most mature. Let them make the first move, and I'll let you figure out who that is. Number three. So first, we die by giving up our rights. Two, we die by putting others first. And finally, we die by taking up our cross and putting our flesh again to death. Philippians 2.8 Speaking about Jesus, it says, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. I've learned over the years that in marriage, at least one of you, one of the partners needs to be humble. If one of you is humble, your marriage can work. If you're both prideful and unwilling to forgive each other and you're just going to cancel each other, then I don't think there's any hope for it. But, but if one of you will yield... And be willing to admit that you're wrong and ask for forgiveness time and time again. I, I've seen marriages work that way. It's way better if you're both humble and both acknowledging your sin and asking for forgiveness. But that takes a death. That takes a death of your flesh. And I just want you to know that dying to yourself is a choice. It's something you can do. And you must do. You must do this. And if you don't, it, it really is. Your flesh, with your flesh, it's kill or be killed. You cannot beat your flesh unless you kill it. Your flesh will kill you. Jesus said this in John 12, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. This is one of the, those great biblical ironies. If you die, you live. That's what Jesus is saying. And coming from Iowa, I, I just think of this process of a seed in the ground. When the seed is planted, it's like it's died. It's in the ground. It's buried. And, and it, if it just fights the process the natural process, and just sits there, I'm not going to do it, I'm not going to do it. It will remain alone. But if it gives into the, the moisture of the soil and the effects of the sun and begins to germinate, then it will sprout and it will, oh, it'll, it'll, have so many, it'll have so much fruit. We know that's true. Jesus is saying that about us. If we are someone who's unwilling to yield, unwilling to acknowledge we're wrong, unwilling to ask for forgiveness, 
We're like that seed that just is in the ground and we won't give in to the process. What process? Of the, the, the water of the Holy Spirit working in our heart and the sun, S-U-S-O-N, shining down on us. And if we yield, we will grow and germinate. And, and Jesus says we'll have so much fruit in our life and in our marriage and our relationships. But we have to die. And all the Christians I know that are alone. Now, they may have people around them, but they're alone. Because they're not practicing these principles. They're not asking for forgiveness. They're not choosing to die to themselves. They're selfish, thinking about only themselves. And selfishness will always leave you empty. Always. When you die to yourself, it hurts, and it's challenging, it's difficult. But when you do that, oh, the fruit is amazing. Jesus promised that. we got to die, though. Let me share this quote with you by Stephen Kender. He wrote the book Love Dare. It's a great book. He said, Almost every sinful action ever committed can be traced back to selfish motive. It is a trait we hate in other people, but we justify in ourselves. Selfishness is all about me. I mean, I have my rights. I need to put myself first. Yeah, I'll like you until you do something I don't like, then I'll cancel you. That's selfish. You're not going to have a good marriage or good relationships with that attitude. We've learned today we need to die. So let's not settle. Men and women, let's not settle for bad or mediocre marriages or relationships. Instead, let's practice what we've learned tonight. Let's, let's learn to die to ourself, die to our rights. Let's learn to die by putting others first. And let's die by taking up our cross and putting our flesh to death where it belongs. Let me just ask you, end with this question. What's the secret to a great marriage? You heard me say it a million times tonight. What's the one word? It starts with D, rhymes with shy. That's right, die. If you want to have a great marriage, go home and die some more. Go home and die some more. And don't forget, especially you guys, it's not about the nail. It's certainly not about you. Lord Jesus, we just ask that you would help all of us with our marriages and our relationships to remember it's not about us. Would you help us practically understand what it means to die to our flesh, to put our flesh to death? Lord, so many people I know, and in fact, right now, as your heads are bowed, this has just come to mind, you have people you're not forgiving right now. There's people, if I ask you, is there someone you haven't forgiven, there would be a name that would come to your mind right now. There's people that are out there that may not even realize that you, you are offended by them and you have not forgiven them. Right now, I'm going to ask you to release that. You know who I'm talking about. God has convicted you right now of that person. And he wants to release you, free you, bless you. Just pray this with me. Lord, I, you know that person. I, I don't like them. They hurt me. They, they hurt my family. They, they did me wrong. And, and I, don't, I don't think I can forgive them, whether it's your, a parent or a sibling or a friend or a spouse. Lord Jesus, the best way I know how. You, you pray this, the best way I know how. You name that name in your brain and you say, I forgive them. I don't feel like forgiving them, but I, by faith, I'm going to step out and forgive them right now. Do that. Do it right now. In your mind, in your heart, offer them forgiveness through Jesus Christ. Don't worry about the feelings. The feelings will catch up. Do what's right right now. Thank you, Jesus, that you forgave me, and I can forgive the way you forgave me unconditionally, and I can forget it. Help me forget it. Help me move past it. We thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen.